And it's a pleasure to welcome you to our final keynote of our Suski on this final day of our symposium. Thank you so much for being with us uh, this past week and for joining us for this inaugural session of a symposium that I hope will continue for years to come and will be all about sharing science, sharing research done by researchers at Oxford and Cambridge uh, from freshers. Uh, one of our speakers, of course, Aaron Coe, was a fresher only coming in this year to our uh, respected keynote speakers who have a wealth of experience in their fields. And today we have exactly such a speaker, a pioneer of bioinformatics. Uh, Dr. Abweiler has led the way in making protein sequence and functional data available to researchers worldwide. His, works, uh, his work of SwissProt in the 1990s results in the creation of a single database for protein sequence and functional information called UniProt, maintained by a consortium of institutes in Europe and the United States. He has also worked on major collaborative projects on protein identification from experiments and on molecular interactions. Research relies on data exchange. And in his talk, Dr. Abweiler will focus on this in the context of COVID-19 in his role as coordinator of the European COVID-19 data platform. Dr. Abweiler currently serves as one of the two directors of the European Bioinformatics Institute, which is situated in Cambridge. And it's part of the wider European Molecular Biology Lab Laboratory. Uh, he has also previously headed the Human Proteomics Organization, and therefore it's my pleasure, and it's a pleasure of everyone on the Varsity Ski Committee to welcome Dr. Abfeiler, our keynote speaker for today. Okay, great. Thanks for the very, very kind uh, introduction. Um, now I feel really old, uh, uh, um, but um, if you go back into the 90s, but anyway, so I want to talk a bit about accelerating research through data sharing, and I want to give you first a bit of an example of what we're doing at the EBI, and then uh, how we um, use the, the infrastructure available for um, the European COVID-19 data platform. So I really would like to point out that we are living through a revolution. Um, and that was really uh, the sequencing of um, many, many genomes and so on. Um, if you look at the, back to 2003, um, genome sequencing costs had already dropped dramatically. The cost of sequencing uh, the first human genome was uh, hundreds of millions to develop all the technology, but of the cost of the sequencing of a human genome in 2003 had already dropped to the cost of one of the most expensive houses in London. And the cost of sequencing a genome in 2020 is not more than uh, the cost of a season ticket um, uh, of your favorite football club. And you can put there whichever club you want. Um, but it's uh, so at the moment, it's, it's uh, uh, the cost of a season ticket for a Premier League uh, club. And in a couple of years, it's probably uh, the, um, the season cost for a season ticket of a small uh, third or fourth league club. So. That means we received over the years incredible uh, growing amounts of data. So if you look at this log, uh, log plot, uh, you can see that the all sorts of data have increased, um, but especially the, the sequencing data. The gray line is the data in the European Nucleotide Archive. Uh, that's part of a collaboration between NCBI, um, EDBJ, and, and us on collecting publicly available nucleotide sequences. And you can see this line um, uh, gr grows constantly and the doubling time, since it's a log plot, uh, the doubling time is around 18 months. The only time it went quicker was when uh, we had this uh, shift from uh, the old um, uh, sequencing systems to the new generation of sequencing systems when it was doubling every six to eight months and we were really fearing that we um, wouldn't be catching up but then we developed better uh, compression algorithms and so on and since then it's again back to around 18 months. But you can also see this reddish line here, um, uh, this one here, that's uh, controlled access uh, uh, human data. And that uh, shows how much we are shifting more towards um, not only sequencing um, all sorts of organisms, but really sequencing a lot of humans for, um, for clinical studies, for, for um, cohort studies, for 
uh, healthcare. And that's growing very quickly. And the controlled access data, the not completely open uh, uh, human data, is now nearly as much as the open nucleotide sequence data. So that's a marked shift. And we can see similar growths of data in, in other areas, whether they are uh, proteomics data sets, whether it's gene expression data sets, single cell uh, gene expression growing especially fast, metabolomics data, and so on. So that means there's a lot for people like us to do, and that's uh, what we try to, um, to work with at the European Bioinformatics Institute, which is Europe's home for biological data services, research and training. We are a trusted data provider for the life sciences. And we are part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, an intergovernmental research organization. We are pretty international. We have around 800 members of staff from around 70 nations. And we host also um, a European infrastructure for coordinating bioinformatics um, uh, uh, infrastructure in Europe, uh, which is called Alexia. And um, so before some of you uh, will ask that later on, just to mention, um, although it has here this big fat word European, uh, we are not affected by Brexit because the European Molecular Biology Laboratory is an intergovernmental research organization. The UK was a founding member of this intergovernmental research organization and was supporting us all the time uh, very well, all of EMBL and especially the EBI. And so uh, they will also support us in future and we will be one of the few organizations in uh, Britain still be thriving in Britain um, with, uh, with a European head on. And we may be the only place um, in, in the UK where we still can get European Commission grants in the future. So that's all from the legal side, um, pretty settled. So. The vision of the EBI is to benefit humankind by advancing scientific discovery and impact through bioinformatics. And our missions to fulfill that is that we want to provide freely available data and bioinformatics services to all facets of the scientific community, to advance the advancement of biology through investigator-driven research in bioinformatics, to provide advanced bioinformatics training to all scientists at all levels, to help disseminate cutting edge technologies to industry and applications to the science and to sort of support as an Alexia node for coordination of biological data provision in Europe. And we have some strategic priorities to, to achieve that, but I will not bore you with that. The real centerpiece of why we were set up is, is the EMBL EBI service mission to enable life science research and its translation to medicine, agriculture, bonds, industries, and society by providing biological data information and knowledge. So that's quite a mouthful. So what does that really mean? That means it's something pretty simple. Labs around the world send us the data, we archive it, we classify it, we share it with other data providers, we analyze at value and integrate it, and then we provide tools to help researchers to use it. And that leads them to new experiments, new data provision, and again, labs around the world send us the data, and we start again. When we moved, we, the, the EMBL EBI's um, predecessor was the EMBL Data Library in Heidelberg. And when we grew out of this uh, size um, of a normal group in, in Heidelberg in the um, late 1980s, we, um, we, did, uh, we worked on setting up an, a dedicated institute as part of EMBL um, um, uh, for, for carrying on with his services. And when we moved in 1994 to Hingston, we were 10 people working on two projects, the Amble Nucleotide Sequence Database and SwissProt. Since then, we have moved on a lot and there are a lot of different uh, resources which people uh, use worldwide, from literature to genes, genomes and variation, to proteins and protein families, to chemical biology, drug discovery, various archives, um, structural data and, and um, molecular systems biology data. So we have moved on quite a lot from really 10 people at that time to now quite a few hundred um, uh, working in Hingston. And one important thing, which I think is part of a success story of uh, bioinformatics is that we all worked as global collaborations worldwide, right from the beginning. Um, a lot of these collaborations are, are really decades old and our data resource teams collaborate with these organizations throughout the world. And of course, internal collaboration is also essential, 
um, but the integration of public molecular data for the global scientific community um, is really one of the uh, um, reasons why biology is now such a successful um, uh, uh, science and probably the leading uh, science area um, uh, nowadays. It's not only that we get a lot of data, it's also that there's a lot of demand. So, so we have more than 300 petabytes of raw storage at MWBI to deal with the data. Um, every day our, um, our website has more than six, around 64 million uh, requests. Every month, more than two and a half million, around two and a half million uh, scientists, or let's say unique IP addresses, uh, sometimes more than um, uh, a scientist or a user uses more than one IP address, more than 2.4 million uh, IP addresses log into our systems. And uh, we handle per month um, to more than 12 million jobs on average. Jobs means that can be, um, that, can be that somebody wants to make a multiple sequence alignment or a blast search or analyze um, all protein content in a genome uh, in interproscan. All of this is meant, uh, meant as one job. We play a really a vital role for, of biomolecular data provision, which was demonstrated by a survey where 45% of the 4,000 people who gave us their opinion said that they could neither uh, um, they could have neither created nor collected the data they used themselves nor obtained it elsewhere. So I think we play a pretty important role in the life of many life scientists. And when the COVID-19 um, um, uh, crisis uh, started in March and we saw, hmm, we need to do something here, uh, we were able to build on this very successful infrastructure we had already in place and this international connections to set up very quickly the so-called European COVID-19 data platform. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, uh, announced uh, that roughly six months ago when we, when we went live. So what, had our, what have we done in, in this context? Well, we, we said, look, we need to start with the patient data that goes into national health data infrastructures or public health uh, laboratories. And the, we need to find a way to get the viral data as quickly as possible into so-called SARS-CoV-2 data hubs for analysis and distribution. But there's also a lot of human data around the, uh, the host um, uh, genetic data uh, collected and that needs um, a different infrastructure. It needs this controlled access infrastructure in the form of a federated uh, European Genome Phenome Archive. This and other data which gets collected for the other resources, we put them together uh, into the COVID-19 data portal to serve it from there to the user community. And as I mentioned before, that is all embedded not only in activities at EBIs, but really uh, Europe and worldwide. So the COVID-19 data plot and platform tries to deal with this diverse data which is out there and facilitates rapid sharing even if there's different degrees of completeness of the data and hope that we facilitate in this way synergy and cross fertilization. There are three important components and I will say a few words about all of these. One is the SARS-CoV-2 data hubs, the data portal and the Federated European Genome Phenome Archive. So you can also look at it in, in this way that there's the data, um, um, there, there are various research streams um, means people are doing something. Then there are activities like ours in, in this context, um, enabling research. I mean, we are also doing some, some research in, in, these, um, in these areas, but I just want to concentrate on the service area this time. Um, so the services, enabling research, and then there are these various streams of data which come through. So there's the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus biology data which we can deal with in uh, building on the European Nucleotide Archive and its data hubs um, and other databases uh, that um, uh, collect data, for, for example, on the chemical screens or on, on structural data. There's the human COVID-19 biology, um, means the host genetics data, which goes into the federated EGA. 
And then there's the much more difficult area of population dynamics of humans and viruses, which is usually um, um, in the interest of clinical researchers and of the public health infrastructures. And this is data we are not directly dealing with, but we need to um, facilitate the interoperability of these data types we mentioned before with these um, data um, uh, gathering activities in these other infrastructures and databases. So what's the, what's the progress? Well, the, the SARS-CoV-2 data hubs, we have, um, con uh, we have contacts with, uh, um, in Europe with more than 45 countries. And for more than a dozen, we have set up already um, data hubs for bringing the, the SARS-CoV-2 viral data into um, uh, our systems and offer them various tools uh, for the analysis. In the, in the Federated European Genome and Phenome Archive, we have uh, started uh, to deploy local EGA nodes. Before, this database was a collaboration between us in, at EBI and the CRG in, in Barcelona. And uh, now um, we are um, making sure that we get as quickly as possible nodes uh, established everywhere in Europe um, for data which can't leave the national boundaries. Uh, we share standards and best practices, and we are working on the operator, oper, oh, that's, a, that's a mouthful, operationalization of these integrated systems. So if we look at the portal where we display a lot of this information, we have a t a tens of thousands of viral sequences. And even more important, we have 65,000 uh, raw viral sequence data sets. That means that's as they come from the, out of the machines, and since we have the raw data sets, we can uh, use standardized uh, pipelines to analyze the data. And people can take this raw data and analyze it with their standardized ways um, uh, too, so that they can compare it uh, like to like. If you get only the assembled sequence, you don't know what people have done with the data to reach to this assembled viral sequences and for, for um, um, complete transparency uh, it's, uh, and for quality control, it's really important that you have always the raw viral sequence data available. We have uh, more than 10,000 variants uh, detected. There are hundreds of protein records uh, annotated on the, and on the protein side. Hundreds of structures are already uh, determined both by X-ray crystallography and by um, electron tomography, which made it into the PDB and EMDB and are displayed from the portal. Eight compound screens uh, of potential for potential repurposing of drugs or for um, of new compounds uh, against potential targets um, of, of, of proteins of a uh, virus have been uh, submitted into Campbell and are displayed there. Um, the open targets activity at EBI um, has uh, identified 390 potential drug targets um, in, um, which could be followed up. We have pathway information, interaction information, a lot of different expression studies. And last but not least, of course, um, a gateway into all the uh, scientific literature around COVID-19, which is out there. And that, are, uh, that is a rapid growing body of, of data. Uh, uh, tens of thousands of publications are already out there and a lot of preprints, which are also indexed and available from there. So a, a nice side effect is really that we uh, were able to accelerate the EGA federation. Uh, um, the European Genome Phenome Archive is one of the two uh, databases of this type in the world um, for dealing with, um, with controlled access data to human genetics data and phenotypic information. The other one is uh, the GAP uh, run by our colleagues at NCBI in, in uh, the US. Um, and that's really important because we want to put together there the, um, uh, into an international network uh, where we want to adapt the EGA centralized model to a federated network of human data repositories with regional hubs and, and uh, uh, regional data providers. That's really important for a lot of um, uh, differences in Europe in, in ethical uh, regulation and other uh, regulatory areas. And, and of course, in, in due to the different national laws and the use of different languages in the phenotypic descriptions of a lot of uh, patients or uh, research subjects in core studies. So 
this EGA, um, this federated EGA, will be a platform for discovery, access, and distribution of human data, as already the current EGA is. Uh, the coordination and standards which are used are, are driven by uh, Alexia, uh, the European uh, Life Science Bioinformatics Research Infrastructure, and by the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which is an international, uh, even more international um, uh, and important group, which really looks into, into uh, facilitating standards which are used worldwide, that has also very strong um, North American, African and Asian component. So 17 out of the 23 Alexia nodes participate in the federated human uh, data community and are setting up such local nodes. And that will be very important right now for the, um, for the, um, for, for looking into the uh, role, the genetic background of patients place in the response to um, and severity of uh, COVID-19. But it will be also a long-lasting legacy for other um, activities, for example, around uh, cancer genomics also for the future. So we are also scaling up the platform. So we are uh, by a structured coordination between central and national uh, elements. As I mentioned before, we are working together with yeah, 45 European countries right now. We at EBI are doing the central coordination of a platform dealing with the biomolecular data uh, linked to the research European infrastructures and uh, overall connections uh, based on our long-standing network of international collaborations around the databases worldwide. And we work then with national coordinations team which really span and reach the scientific research community of this country. They even have to reach also, of course, into the healthcare space. They need to have a reach into the political environment so that, uh, so that people are really, well, nudged into um, getting the data into the, uh, into the public as quickly as possible. And they need to be savvy in the right informatics and data technology because otherwise it will not work. And these national coordination teams coordinate then the national data flows. They broker the data, uh, uh, the, the submission of data into the central repositories. They look after the, the clinically focused uh, projects and try to link that all up for more central things. So there are examples um, of, of such national portals already um, existing as a focus for the national uh, COVID-19 uh, activities. So they offer, as I mentioned, a data management support service and data uh, brokering and link uh, with the European COVID-19 portal functions. That's just a screenshot of a Swedish portal, uh, which was the first one of the national portals, which uh, uh, was set up as clones of the uh, EBI one. Um, we also uh, used our international uh, collaboration uh, around the nucleotide sequences, the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration, to uh, make once again a statement where we say, look, fair and open access to data is essential. Fair stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And the INSDC's public databases at DDBJ, at MLDBI, and at NCBI provide the only way to achieve this. Um, and our European COVID-19 platform provides them deep support for data submission as NCBI uh, pro uh, provides such support, as DDBJ uh, uh, gives such support. And we exchange this data uh, overnight uh, bit among us. So we recommend that all data, uh, raw data goes into ISDC. Um, all consensus and assembly sequence also flow to INSDC databases. Um, we want to have useful yet achievable metadata. We, um, that's always a very, very important topic. Of course, we want to have as much data around the sample and around the uh, uh, product, uh, production of the samples and uh, of, the, of the sequences as possible. But that makes them just more work for the submitters. So we need to find there a, a balance between speed and ease and usability. And where uh, the data flows are established, they should also submit the data, the, the uh, assembled sequence to a database called GSET. Um, for you, if you want to engage, um, please access the growing integrated data and services. 
please share your data if you produce data, connect to related resources, um, and, or let us know of um, related resources we should connect to. And if you want to give feedback on the portal, we are looking for volunteers to participate in our usability testing to make this, uh, this database more useful and um, better understandable by everyone. And that's the address where you can contact us if you want to um, be a volunteer, our little guinea pig for the uh, portal usability testing. And with that, I just say, uh, if you have more questions, oh, sorry, that was taken from another uh, presentation and I should have taken that out. With that, I say thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Edweiler, for introducing us to the wonderful effort um, and initiative by the uh, EBI team. So I'm now taking questions from both Zoom and YouTube. So if you're on if you're on Zoom, you could choose to ask your questions in person, send them on the chat, or send them to me privately. Um, so I have one. There's one question on Zoom. So um, Dr. Eckweiler, you have previously established a sweet prot protein sequence database and uniprot. How do you think these experiences contributed to your involvement in establishing the COVID-19 data portal? Well, actually, um, it, it definitely helped me uh, to, to know how to navigate uh, uh, projects. But I think the, the really important point was here that I had a bit of spare time. Um, uh, I, I had just handed over a lot of tasks because I wanted to um, start working part time and not full time anymore. And then the crisis hit. And so I had spare time and capacity, capacity that was more helpful. But what was really helpful was that we had already ongoing collaborations around um, 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 pathogen surveillance of um, um, infectious agents uh, causing foodborne diseases and uh, animal pests. That was Guy Cochran, who runs the ENA team. Um, he worked together with uh, groups in uh, Netherlands uh, at Erasmus Medical Center around Marion Koopmans, with people at the DTU in Copenhagen and with people in Hungary on, um, on so-called compare data hubs for pathogen surveillance for these foodborne diseases and animal pests. And he had also already set up such data portals for, for that. And this was the infrastructure we directly recycled then into COVID-19. And I was brought in for, for doing the politics and the hard work is really all done by, by uh, Guy and his team. So as I said, it has, it's just that I wanted to become lazy and do something else. And when I had spare capacity, that was the reason why I got involved. Thank you. Um, one question from Zoom. How could we, or how are we planning to standardize phenotypic descriptions between languages? Ha, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a really, really uh, difficult task. And the, the problem is there, there are standard descriptions of, of clinical uh, parameters. A lot of these uh, 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 descriptors, unfortunately, are not open source and freely available and, and reusable in all contexts. So that is one thing where we really need to, to liberate that and bring that into uh, an open world, as we have it for many standards we use in, in the more basic uh, biological and, and life sciences. So, so that's, that's an important thing. And then we need to find ways at least to build translate, translating um, links between these different languages that we know that something which is in Mandarin this and in English that and in German this, um, that this is the same. So it's unfortunately, it's, it's not a technical problem as such. It's, it's really hard work of a semantics that people go through that and say, oh, this is equals that and uh, makes these links and then bring that into uh, controlled vocabularies um, um, and um, ontologies, uh, which are free 
usable and reusable everywhere. And that I think is a tradition we had in the biological sciences. That's why we were so successful uh, in, in modern biology over the last decades. But the medical field never fought like that. It was very much embedded in national systems, in had, had completely different drivers. And we are now seeing a paradigm shift uh, to, how we can bring that also into the clinical research setting and into the healthcare setting. So I think that that's still a lot to do, but um, at least the problem is clear. And with such use cases like COVID, it really accelerates the development. Thank you. Mm, there's one more, well, a few more actually. Um, so how would you see your experiences from the data portal so far informing your work in the future? So, mm, well, one thing is, one thing what we learned is we were lucky that we had already a very good um, working um, international infrastructure out there so that we could bring these different data types really very rapidly together and people can make use of it. So that was what's fantastic. It also again informed us about the importance for making even more data open and fair. Um, and it showed us where, where our limitations are and where we, where we really need to have um, cultural shifts to move towards facilitating open and fair data. And the example of the clinical descriptors of, of, this, um, of this shared open standards, how to describe that, which spans the, uh, over all the languages, which uh, can map the languages into the, this framework. That's, that's, I think, the centerpiece of it all. I believe another thing is that you need to have a very, very thorough thinking, um, we as, as society worldwide, what is the right of privacy of people versus the right of benefit of people from access to research data? Uh, a lot of data in the controlled access arena in the clinical field is not as, of course, not as accessible uh, as it is um, as, as a sequence of a chimpanzee uh, is in the nucleotide sequence database or in the protein databases. But so, because there, there are, of course, privacy concerns, but how much do we slow down progress by making it too hard? Where do we get the balance? What should be the balance? How do we facilitate that? That's a very big ethical question. It was there in the past. It's never gone away, but again, now it becomes more acute because we could do certain things faster if we would have solved these problems already. Thank you very much. Um, so there are a few more questions. Um, I think there are two which are slightly linked. So the first one is, is the team behind the COVID-19 data platform currently planning to expand their work? The second one is, would you see the EJ Federation expanding beyond Europe? So they are asking more in terms of the future plans. Um, yeah, well, I think at the, the, the most important thing for us right now is still mobilizing the data, getting all the data which is out there into, um, into the uh, right databases, and then um, facilitating uh, the reanalysis of, of the data. Um, that's, that's how we try to expand in, in one dimension. And then it's then this dimension of uh, we have a few pilot projects uh, going on how to link the clinical data to this open data. So, of course, what you really want to at some stage is that you know, oh, I have here samples uh, coming from these patients. And for these, I have here the virus sequences, here the genetics data of this person, here the clinical data, how this person reacted to um, on the disease, to treatment. Um, here the radiology data, here the serology data, but that you can navigate between this 
in a in a way that you protect the privacy of the patients or research subjects, but that you can really analyze the data. So that's our that's the um, the biggest thing we try to, to tackle. And we have uh, pilot uh, projects with the Netherlands and with, with Spain and uh, with Germany right now ongoing and hope that we learn from that, that, uh, that we can extend that to, uh, to a more global scheme. Um, it, it touches on many of these points I mentioned before of lack of, of uh, shared standards, open standards, uh, lack of uh, shared regulatory uh, frameworks. Um, and, and so it, this may be uh, game changing uh, when we get a few of these successful on, uh, up and running. Thank you. Um, so perhaps one more question. What advice would you give to any young scientists keen to get involved with uh, bioinformatics? Oh, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, this, this is, there are, there are a lot of great courses you can take, uh, both um, uh, st uh, structured, very structured master courses. Uh, EBI has a, 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 I hope, quite good uh, online training uh, uh, program. Um, there are a lot of places where you could go for internships. Um, so there are various routes into it. Um, but I, but I, although I'm, I'm working in this field already since a while, you see, it doesn't matter so much um, what, you, what you really specialize on. I think what's, what's really important is that we think about how to work together, how to, uh, how to work with other people who compensate for the things you can't do yourself. So if you bring something to the team and you need some complementarity from somebody else and to have this, this, this ability to understand what you can do and what you can't do and where you need help and where you look for the best people to give you this help, I think that's the most important thing you can learn uh, during your studies and during your career. And if you, if you play that well, teams are always beating individuals. <laughs> Um, thank you very much once again. Um, I think if there are no more questions, um, I'll pass on I'll uh, pass on the stage to Christoph. And thank you everyone for the questions, and thank you, Dr. Atwana, for answering those questions. Pleasure. So uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Atwana, for a brilliant talk. And I think uh, your last point uh, in answer to that final question uh, that really sums up everything that this talk was about, that teams are greater than individuals, because at the risk of stating the obvious, science is all about collaboration, about uh, sharing, about working together, um, and of course, uh, access to data, um, access to shared and standardized framework to use this data, to then, as uh, Professor Naismith in his keynote highlighted, to uh, take that a leap of imagination to a new theory, to a new concept. That's something that we all need to work on. And well, of course, uh, the work that you've done has already identified 390 potential drug targets against uh, COVID-19. And I'm sure that the work that you're doing right now, creating these networks, creating these standards will, and of course, it's already done a lot to help uh, tackle the current situation as well as other potential um, healthcare crises. And I hope that uh, we'll continue to do so in the future. I would also like to thank everyone who was able to join us either on Zoom or through the live stream, as well to anyone who might be watching this talk at some point in the future. Um, do join us for our final session of the Varsity Ski Symposium, which will be later on this evening and will be on neurobiology. But in the meantime, thank you so much to our keynote speaker, as well as to everyone who joined and goodbye. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.